Welcome to On the Rise, How Maestro Music is Changing the Theater Industry. Uh, my name is Nancy Giles, and I'm going to be, um, I guess, hosting the panel, or in whatever that's called. But to start, um, let me hand the, phone, the microphone to Shira Gans, who's from the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Shira? Hello, everybody. Is this on? Yes. OK. It's great to see everyone. I'm Shira Gans from the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. We're the city agency that supports all the creative sectors, and I'm the person who supports the music industry. So I created New York Music Month about seven years ago, and here we are today. It's really exciting to be at this event. It started mostly focused more on the, on the industry side, and then as it's grown and encompassed more aspects of the music industry, what's more iconic than Broadway, right, the musical theater. So it's very exciting to have this conversation. We really try to have a focus on equity and access to all the work our agency does, but particularly in Music Month. So I'm really excited to hear the conversation. There's still a lot of events happening this week. You can check it out at nymusicmonth.nyc, and hopefully I'll see you guys around. Thank you, Gia. Before we start our discussion, I just want to give a few shout outs to uh, Invest in Access for securing today's ASL interpreters, Ashley, Selena, and Rory. Thank you, Invest in Access. <laughs> to Disney Theatricals for their hosting us and for these incredible chairs that have footrests. <laughs> so beautiful, yes. Disney Theatrical. Yeah. Yeah. And to Kendra Scott for these beautiful bling accessories that we all have. We're very happy with them, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you to all of them. Um, I guess the word I was looking for was moderator earlier. And let me uh, introduce our incredible, incredible panel today. We have next to me Georgia Stitt, who is a composer, lyricist, and music director, and the founder of Maestro Music. She's also a music supervisor for something coming up in July, Broadway concert with Boston Pops at Tanglewood. And she's just, in general, a really groovy lady, Georgia Stitt. <laughs> Next to Georgia is Victoria De Detrez, is that right? Detrez. Detrez, who is the program manager for Rise Theater. Give it a, and she is a independent producer, Victoria. <laughs> Next up, we have Cody Renard Richard, who's a Broadway stage manager, most recently of Lempica, and a co-stage manager of the Tony Awards. We're gonna hear about that. <laughs> and he's a founder of the CRR Scholarship Program and a Rice Theater Circle of Advocates member. Cody? <laughs> Finally, we have Helen Park, who is the first Asian female composer on Broadway with K-pop. Give it up for her. <laughs> and she's a member of Maestra, and she's got uh, some songs in the movie on Netflix, Over the Moon, and upcoming uh, Helen is going to be writing the music for Crazy Rich Asians, which is being developed by Warner Brothers Theatricals. Congratulations. Georgia, let's start with you, because the more I get to know you and the more I get to know about Maestra, the more impressed I am about what this organization has done. But let's go back. Tell me how it started. OK, hi. Thank you. Um, I, I'm impressed with the way the organization's grown to so quickly in such a short amount of time. We're actually here because this is the five-year birthday of Maestro. We were founded five years ago. And, uh, we wanted to do something flashy for our five-year anniversary, so we called Nancy. <laughs> uh, because I'm so flashy. <laughs> anyway, please continue. Um, well, the origin story is, in 2016, I was music directing a production of Sweet Charity off-Broadway. Um, Lee Silverman was the director of that production, and it was the, the version that starred Sutton Foster. I've told this story many times, so some of you in the room have probably heard it before, but for those who haven't, um, Lee said her version of the show, the reason that you would revive a show like Sweet Charity now is because you had something to say about how it spoke to contemporary culture. And she thought there was something really interesting about the way Sweet Charity, the character of Charity, behaved differently when she was in the room in the safety of her girlfriends, the people that she worked with, her dance hall hostesses, than she was when she was out in the world looking for a boyfriend. And so she really wanted to play with like how we code switch when we're in spaces with only women and when we're out in public 
and not in those spaces. And because a lot of her songs happen when she's in the dressing room with the women, and because the, the band was going to be visible on stage, she said, I think the band needs to be all female because they'll be part of that safe space. And just that is already radical. I know, right? Right? right. That's Lee Silverman, who is directing Suffs on Broadway right now, so you can see the trajectory of what she has to say to the world as well. Um, and Georgia, not to interrupt, but I think it's important to note that this was in 2016, which was a very important right. year. Yes, I told Nancy backstage that um, we were actually in, in I don't know if it was rehearsals or performance, yeah, yeah. in January, right, uh, in November, uh, of the election, right, the election, we, <laughs> during that time, and we were doing a show about a woman who kind of can't get a break and can't can't get what she needs. And there's, you know, the morning after the, ele the election, we all came in we, and we sat collectively and we were like, okay, we have to do this show tonight and we have to tell this story and we have to tell the story in a different context than we thought we were telling it. So all of that, like trying to figure out how life imitates art and art imitates life. But, but to get to the maestra part, um, because she asked us, Mary Mitchell Campbell is the orchestrator of that show and she's one of my partners in crime and many things. Um, she said, I would like you to hire an all female band and it's important to me that we don't default to them all being white people, that it's a diverse group of women, at the time it was women, who, um, who uh, look like the city. And, um, and that was our mandate and we could not find those women. There, was, there were six musicians, I was one of them, so we needed to find five players and we could not find them. We had to admit our own biases that we were like, we'll just call our guys. We'll call the guys that we always play with. My bass player's a guy, my drummer's a guy, my rhythm guitar player's a guy. And then we're like, okay, we can't call those guys. Who are, who's, who are the women? And we're like, hmm, I, I know one. Mary Mitchell's like, I know one. And we called her and she wasn't available. And so we, you know, it, we called contractors and they, they referred us to the same one woman. Um, and ultimately, I'll skip over all these details except to say we finally called that woman and said, I know you're not available to do this gig, but who are your colleagues? Who are the women? Who are the, your students? Who are your people who are, you know, your subs? And she had a list. And so that was how one instrument got resolved the next instrument. And ultimately, Mary Mitchell knew a drummer who lived in Atlanta and she asked her to move to New York and she did and she got, she moved to New York because we couldn't, uh, anyway, all of that was to say at the end of this process, I had a spreadsheet of the people we had contacted and people started to say, I hear you have a spreadsheet. Who are these women? We want to hire these women too. And I was like, I don't want to be the keeper of this spreadsheet. I don't want to be, I'm not an agent. Um, and I, and so I have web designers who had recently built a directory for me for my music. I put all my music online and I was like, I want people to be able to search. Like I'm looking for an up-tempo, I'm a tenor. I want it to be funny. Oh. So I'm going to use these search filters to see what you have in your catalog. And I said, can we use those same, that same functionality and build a directory so people can look for or a musician. They need a bass player who lives in New York, who also is a member of the union, or whatever the search filters are. And so um, Roundhouse Design, Ryan Foy and Nick Gasworth built that, um, built that website for me. And that was the beginning of what became the Maestra Directory, which now has 2,300 people in it. It's global. Wow. Wow. And it is people, I mean, there are people in this room who I know have been hired because they have a profile in the Maestra Directory. <laughs> And that will spin off into what I know Vic is going to talk about next. So I'm going to cede the floor to All the right. next person. Hand it over to Vic. Hi. Oh. Hi. Should I just talk yeah, about it? Yeah, keep going. Because you, okay. through Maestra, developed Rise. Is that correct? Yeah. Explain. Uh, what is Rise? What is Rise? Uh, Rise actually has a built-in acronym. I should start there. It's Representation, Inclusion, and Support for Employment. Um, we started this, I came into this. It was Georgia's baby along with Lin-Manuel Miranda and the Miranda Family Fund. They came together because uh, Lynn previously had a relationship with Array Crew and they have a uh, backstage for film and television for Diversify and who works there. So they were like, we wanna do something for the theater industry. What is, who would be a good partner? Um, and just coincidentally, um, he ran into Georgia at a pumpkin patch and they were just. Wait, what is pumpkin patch for people? Literally a pumpkin literally patch. Literally a pumpkin patch. Literally. No, it's literally a pumpkin patch. <laughs> Oh, pumpkin patch. I've got to write that down. It's, it's, it's like a Broadway club. Networking. It was the fall. It was literally we were both getting pumpkins. <laughs> and he was like, oh, hey, I've been meaning to call you. Oh, my God. <laughs> the power of pumpkins. Go the on. Yeah, the fall really does it. Um, so they met, and they thought, 
Maestro had this infrastructure of a directory, so can we work together? Um, and then I came along, and I joined the team, and this was in January of 2023, and they said, okay, we're gonna launch in June, and I went, great. Um, <laughs> so we had to really figure out what does this look like um, to build a directory that serves our industry to fight the narrative that diverse candidates don't exist. Um, I have Isn't that annoying, by the way? What do you mean? What do you well, mean? I, I, love this, I love this quote of George's. When, when you hear, because I've heard it constantly, we tried to find a fill in the blank, person of color, person with disability, gender fluid, whatever. But those people just don't exist. They don't, and it's crap. Um, yes. Okay, I come from, I come from the producing world, and I have been in so many rooms in which I was the one candidate of color, and they were like, okay, so who are some designers we should know about? And I'd be like, how do you not know these people? Like, they're working in nonprofit theaters. Um, here's a list of five people that I would recommend. But then I would still fight the uphill battle of like, well, they don't have that much, um, uh, too many credits, they're not, not ready, enough experience. They don't have enough credits. And then it was like, oh, so I'm talking to walls here. Okay, great. It's a um, vicious cycle. Yeah, it's if, a vi if you haven't gotten the job, you're not going to get the jobs, yeah. too. All right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been in those rooms, and this was really pivotal to me because as a producer, I felt like my role is always one of advocacy. You have to advocate for the artists that you're working with and making sure that I was always putting diverse candidates first, and that's part of my ethos as a producer. I support artists who don't have access. Um, because a lot of the time, if you don't have a regional credit, you're not getting produced. And that's actually a really bar big barrier to access. Um, so I came on to the team, and we built this. Basically, it's like the LinkedIn for the industry, because LinkedIn does not serve us. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, you need to know if you can handle a wrench, and you can't put that in your LinkedIn bio. I mean, you could. Um, but uh, we built this, and it's just been a really exciting, because we serve everyone but actors, and I think no one really understands how many jobs there are in theater. When you graduate college, you're like, oh, stage manager, director, actor. That's really kind of all you think there is. But musician. there's- Musician. Yeah, and musician. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, there's so many admin roles, and there's so many people that go into creating a production, and I really wanted to like, demystify the business of Broadway and the business of theater as a whole. Um, so really, we're just, we saw a need. There's been so many Excel spreadsheets beforehand, so I have to give credit to every community that came before us because there have been people doing the work. So we, this is just a natural evolution of years of community building. And can I speak to that? That just we, we have made a real point to say it's not our place to steamroll what someone else has done, and we are a very yes and organization. And if someone else is already doing the work, we, are, we, we put it under one umbrella, and then we send people to that organization and say, we're not doing that. They are. You should pay attention to them. But if we have made them visible, then that's good for everybody collectively. Yeah, that's where our network partners come in. Um, <laughs> what a good way to, yeah. Basically, um, we want to be very conscious of there is there's so much amazing work going out there. RISE is just acting as a conduit of connection. So, hey, you want an accessibility statement? Here are the organizations we'd recommend for you to find one. Um, really just trying to um, move from the abundance mindset of there are so many resources. If we all work together to amplify, then we're all going to be better off. Um, so I'm going to pass that to Cody because he has an amazing program, the Cody Renard Richard Scholarship. Yes, program. that's great. And I just want to thank you for saying what you said about the, the abundance of other jobs that people might not think of. Because I know when I was in school, the you know, the very glamorous, the actor, the director, stage manager, not as glamorous, but you're gonna you're gonna shake our <laughs> you're gonna shake that up. A composer, lyricist, you hear about those, and then the other jobs were always uh, sort of lumped in this administrative way, and people sort of look down on those, which no one should. And there's opportunities for all kinds of creative expression outside of what is the traditional, what's traditionally thought of as those theater jobs. Last thing, and then I'm sorry. Um, but I also do want to recognize that we have seen a move for more representation on stage, but backstage matters so much yes. because those are the people making decisions. If you have no diverse candidates backstage, there's no real change happening. Um, so that's really what we're working towards. That's absolutely right. Thank you. Which takes us <laughs> to Cody Renard Richard. Now, among other things I've wanted to ask, like someone, I just heard someone use the term um, stage manager brain. So what is that exactly? <laughs> because, you know, I mean, the first job that I did off Broadway, I don't even think I was aware of what a stage manager does. You guys, you run the whole schmageggy. 
correct? <laughs> How, what brought you to being a stage manager? Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Cody. Um, what brought me to being a stage manager? Um, I had a teacher in high school who ultimately told me I needed to do this thing. I was a, um, I tell this story all the time. I was a troubled kid. I was always in detention and um, things like that because I was a class clown. And my counselor told me I needed to take up an extracurricular activity to uh, you know, release some of the energy that I had. <laughs> um, so I joined the theater and uh, my high school drama teacher, Carrie Wood, who I'm still close to today, um, essentially was like, you should be our stage manager. You have this way of making people listen to you without yelling. And at 14, I was like, oh, I get to be in charge? <laughs> Got it. <Okay>. So, <laughs> so she saw something in me at a very young age, and I started stage managing all of the shows. And I think what I liked about it, it gave me a sense of responsibility that I didn't have at that time. Um, so I did all of that, and then she helped me get into college. I went to school for stage managing, and then I moved here and kind of made it happen. Um, you know, stage manager brain. I mean, it, it really means different things for different people. What does it mean um, for you, Cody? For me, I don't know. I think, you know, as a stage manager, we're always aware of what's happening around us. There's so many things always moving. So for us, we kind of have to know, you know, what this person's doing over here and what this person's doing over there and also, like, keep a level head while that's happening. So I love um, being the person who helps put all the puzzle pieces together. And that's kind of in a, a very small uh, description of kind of like what that is. I mean, you really do from being like the bartender, you know, sure. the, the shrink of the play, because you you're aware of people's different temperaments, what's going on backstage, what's supposed to happen in the course of the show. And you just co-stage uh, co managed the Tony Awards. Mm -hmm. Now, what was that like with all that different stuff going on backstage, all those different shows. It's wild, it's <laughs> wild. Um, but it's a good time. This, this was my third time uh, being on the SM team for the Tonys. Um, normally I'm there, hopefully, you know, with a show that I'm working on, <laughs> not this year. Anyway, um, uh, but the Tonys is massive, and this was the first time that it was at Lincoln Center, but there are like 20 uh, stage managers who wow. work on the Tonys, so we all have very different responsibilities. That just um, shows you something, how important stage managers are. Absolutely. They need 20. Absolutely. Absolutely. For the Tonys. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, so we all like, you know, we all kind of take our little stations, and then there's one person who oversees everything. Um, and, and yeah, it's wild. Do you want to talk right now about the scholarship program you started? I can, yes. So um, I started a scholarship program um, with Broadway Ad Advocacy, Advocacy Coalition uh, back in 2020. Um, the program is for, uh, much like RISE, uh, off-stage um, theater-related um, degrees. So folks who are concentrating in stage managing, designing, uh, chore choreography, you know, there's directors, we've had some musicians come through. And it's for um, uh, uh, young people of color um, who are in undergrad and grad school. And essentially this program came about um, because when I first started working in the theater in New York, I was always the only person behind the table who was of color, who was black, who, you know, I didn't really have any mentors who looked like me coming up. So I wanted to give access to folks, um, to people who are working here uh, in New York. I think that's the biggest thing for, you know, younger folks in Oklahoma and in wherever they are, they, you know, they get on Playbill or they see all these faces and they feel like it's so far away when it's really not. Um, so we're going into our fifth year. Um, we bring in about 10 students every, every year and we do a series of workshops. We work with them on community building and leadership skills and, um, and uh, mentorship and all of that, and then we fly them here to New York so they can actually meet with some of their mentors in person and see some shows and kind of see what the New York scene is like. Um, and every year, uh, I just wanna say this and then I'll pass it on, but every year I'm always, I'm always like, oh, I, am I doing enough or is this thing worth it? And then the students come in and you can see how much it means to them, because a lot of them are in PWIs and they don't see themselves reflected even in the classes that they work with. That, that they work with PWIs or even are? Yeah. 
Yeah, for the uh, sorry, family. primary white institutions. That's um, a new expression that I've never heard. Oh, yeah. I'm going to write that down. Yes. So a lot of them, you know, their professors um, also don't look like them, and they feel isolated. So it's, so it's amazing to see these students come together and really come out of their shells and talk to each other about things that are going on on their campuses that are kind of happening everywhere. So, um, so it's really, it was eye-opening, and it's, it's amazing to see that when they come together. And Cody, I've just got to say, you say 10 students a year, five years, that's 50 students. That's amazing that you've done that. Yeah. You guys are amazing. Helen Park, uh, I'm throwing it to you now because I, I'm always curious about what draws people to the work that they do. And what drew you to being a, a composer? And uh, maybe, I don't know if it was specifically a, a musical that you saw or some yeah. theater artist or the sirens that we're hearing. <laughs> That's music. Yeah, I, I was um, class, classically trained um, in piano when I was um, five years old. And so I love playing the piano, but um, it was not until when I was in sixth grade, um, when I was involved in this uh, summer camp, musical theater summer camp, uh, and playing the role of a minstrel in um, Once Upon a Mattress. Um, <laughs> where, uh, Just Cody's next when I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I really fell in love with musical theater. And I remember that was like a summer school in Virginia um, where my aunt w was living at. And um, I was just staying there f just for the summer. But um, I just like memorized the whole score and I just loved, I, I wanted to be like, Winif I wanted to be Winifred, but <laughs> there was like, I yeah, they would cast me as a minstrel. But I, um, and then I, so I looked up like what opportunities there are. Like, I mean, I was only in sixth grade, but I just wanted to like see what kind of people work on Broadway. And of course, all composers are all mostly like white men and um, not a lot of Asian uh, people who look like me. And so I was just like, oh, okay, well, I'll just imagine that, you know, I, I, I had a great experience here and I'll, I'll just be a fan of this work. And I just didn't really, you know, even dream up the possibility of becoming a Broadway composer ever. Um, but I did get uh, into loving songwriting mm -hmm. and just, I started writing songs. And I thought the, maybe the most probable thing that can happen to me would be maybe a, a, a K-pop writer in Korea um, because I knew that, you know, not just musical theater, but like pop or anything else in America, like. A, like someone like me, like working in that f music field was just impossible in my mind. And so I started, I went to Korea um, and just like started teaching myself music production and writing. You moved like, there? You moved there? Uh, well, my, my family was living there. Um, and uh, I, but I was going to college in Canada. So I went, um, I, I took a break from school and I started trying to like write songs for for K-pop artists or and uh, yeah I just taught myself a lot of those and then um, but my par parents pressured me to get a degree like finish my degree like college degree which was in um, subject. Part of, oh, I was actually in pre-med. Long story. <laughs> um, but, uh, I yeah, I actually changed. <laughs> yeah, like, I really wanted to focus. Uh, I was also double majoring in piano performance. But um, I wanted to. Pre-med and piano performance. Yeah, yes. It's a lot. Yeah, it was a lot. So I really s switched my uh, path um, to <laughs> focusing on music. And, um, and then I found this. Uh, grad program at NYU um, called uh, the Graduate Musical Theater Writing Program, oh, yes. and that was going to check both boxes of like academic success, according to my parents, and um, <laughs> and uh, and also my passion for musical theater, and I wanted to learn the craft. So um, so I had all those, you know, the sort of K-pop writing and just songwriting, love for songwriting, and I brought it to NYU um, and started. Um, learning the craft of musical theater, and um, and somehow uh, it ha so happened that Ars Nova, this off Broadway theater, was working or working on a new show that was called K-pop, and they were looking for uh, writers who who write K-pop, and so um, so my colleague at um, at, at school he um, introduced me to Ars Nova and I got commissioned to write music for that. And that show changed my life. Um, and I was like, 
it was so weird because it wasn't like musical theater, like in the traditional sense. But I kind of felt this like responsibility, like, oh, I'm bringing my culture to the New York scene and I don't want to embarrass you know, people of my community. I want to, you know, do my best at like making this uh, a show that people will like enjoy and understand and relate to. Um, so I really grabbed that chance and worked hard at that show. And um, yeah, and then that transferred to, to Broadway and somehow I, yeah, I got to work as a, as a Broadway composer, but um, yeah, I did not dream of, of, of this, um, but it really, you know, the journey, I, I, I do see a lot of progress actually, I mean, uh, from when I was in sixth grade to now, I, I do see a lot more diversity in the broad, um, Broadway scene, but I do, um, I do still see that, you know, a lot of, especially like Asians feel very like tokenized. Mm -hmm. Like I see like, you know, production prim primarily um, you know, white dominated, but then there's like one Asian, you know, and that is like, so a lot of Asians I think go in this like scarcity mindset, but it is improving thanks to Maestra and Rise. Um, I also can't ever forget that first time um, Maestra did this concert um, in collaboration with Disney, um, Women on Broadway, and I didn't even have a show on Broadway yet then, but um, I was included uh, in this, like, you know, in the team of, like, amazing women, and, you know, when Georgia asked me to, like, be a part of that concert, I was like, oh, yeah, this, like, it's really empowering. It empowers you to, you know, to be a, a part of a community. Um, it, it empowers you to do the things that you're passionate about with confidence and more passion. So, yeah, I mean, so th I, I, I'm grateful for, for uh, Georgia and uh, Vic and, yeah, everyone who, who do this work. Great. What a great story. What a great story. <laughs> I have to follow up with a couple of things. One, um, Shy used to be my audition song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something about, I mean, and I'm big and tall anyway, so it wasn't the big surprise when I would go, Shy, you know. <laughs> but I love Once Upon a Mattress. And I, I also it. just love hearing the origin stories of how everybody got, got the interest and started doing this kind of work. Can I shout out to Mary Rogers, who is the composer of Shy? There oh, are so right. few a women, composer. so few women composers from that era, and she was singular. Thank you, yeah. Georgia. That's absolutely true. I guess I'm going to open up questions now, and anybody can jump in whenever. You don't have to go in order um, and all that jazz. Um, just hearing your story, though, Helen, it just I think it underscores how important these connections and these directories and and what you created, Georgia, has been to people. Can you talk about what the experience was in finding work and connecting with people before Maestra and now, how that's changed? Oh, oh sorry. Any of you. Um, I could say I, something we're tackling, I would say, in Rise is I think a lot, I'm very fortunate of all of my jobs came because someone remembered me. I was a recommendation. And that is an amazing system. What happens if you don't have access to those rooms in which you can be recommended to, right? Um, so right now what we're seeing is that it goes to an earlier point I made of no one's willing to take a chance on new candidates. Um, so how are we um, going against the grain of you shouldn't keep going to the same five people for the hiring purposes. You should use a directory and take a chance on someone you haven't met before because you were limiting your options. And also, if you're going to the same five people, you're getting the same five candidates. Um, so we're really trying to expand that. And also, trust building is hard. You know, you're, No matter what, you're investing in someone and the potential of what they can bring to the table. But I think that can be scary when it's new and unfamiliar. Um, so how do you move through that um, unfamiliarity uh, little swamp? You said something interesting uh, uh, before about, <laughs> uh, uh, just one sec, about um, uh, how this is like LinkedIn doesn't work for this kind of thing. And, and knowing people and being able to recommend people is, is very important. I would imagine before Maestra and Rise, you know, it, did it feel more like you guys were like all on your own? You were out, out there by yourselves? I mean, yeah, I mean, especially for stage managers, we don't have agents. So like a lot of designers do. Um, so how do you get work? Word of mouth, being in the right place at the right time, important. doing the right gig, and then being remembered and someone recommending you to do something else. And that's important to note, right? It's not, you don't have agents, you're right. So 
And I'll say stage managers are always like the hardest to find because they're always booked and busy and then you have to be like, <laughs> just try to find the next one. So stage management is also really specific and specific skill set, um, which is why a directory is useful because you can see what skill sets they have right. that you need for your job. Cody, before Meister and Rise, I mean, that's what you're describing is pretty much how you would get work, right? Prince would recommend you, you do a job. I mean, essentially, yeah. 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 I, I got my first job in New York. I moved here. I didn't really know many people. I was on Playbill.com, and I was like looking at all of the the job postings, and I would reach out to folks, and most time when they post stuff, they're not really looking to hire anyone. They just have to post the thing. So I would reach out, and I wouldn't hear anything, and then I was just seeing all these press releases, and I saw that they were, someone was doing a show called Hello Again at this off-Broadway theater. So I emailed the director and was like, hey, do you need stage managers? And then this person wrote me back, and I, he hired me as a PA, so I just kind of like searched for it. So there's not really a... A, a, a rubric of how to do it, you know, because most people aren't looking to interview new people. So it's kind of just like you had to figure it out, you know? Right. Georgia, I stopped you from saying something earlier. Do you remember what you were going to say? I do remember. Okay. Yeah, I think um, it's all, it is still word of mouth. It is still, I mean, but the, the directories wind up being support for that word of mouth. Like if I recommend you for something and then um, you go look me up. The, the, I'm getting the pronouns wrong. But if I recommend somebody for something and you go look that person up and they're in the Meister directory, they're in the Rise directory, they're in the Muse directory, there are a lot of directories that are that are changing the way people can be found in the industry, um, then you can read their bio. You can see, in, on the Meister directory, you can see a sample video of their work. You know, And so it's you don't necessarily have to audition a player. You can watch them play and see what level is this is this player. And one of the practices that I've adopted since doing this work is I start identifying in my brain, when I have hiring power, I say, is this a high stakes gig or a low stakes gig? What do you mean by that? I mean, if it's a recording session and I there's no room for error and you cannot make mistakes, of course everyone makes mistakes, but really the pressure is very high, mm -hmm. I'm gonna hire people that I have worked with before and I know they're gonna show up and they're gonna deliver. That is not a place to take a risk on someone. But there are lots and lots of gigs that I get asked to hire concerts at, I'll say like 54 Below or Birdland or things where like I'm, I'm putting a showcase together for a composer and they want a band and it's not like I, you can afford to like totally ruin the event, but if you're... <laughs> But if you're no, there's some wiggle room. Though. But if you're an, an above average, <laughs> intermediate to advanced player, right. and you can hold your own, and it's a chance for me to get to know you as a player, and possibly be able to give you some feedback, or you might meet the bass player, and the two of you hit it off, and that is an opportunity to, to bring someone in the room who then has the experience. And sometimes in that room, people are like, "Oh, I have to practice. Like, if this is where, if this is the level of how we're working, and this is how fast things move, then I have to practice." And that is an opportunity that you can't just get you have to be you have to be brought into a room so I really try to identify like do I really have to hire the, the six people that I always work with here or is this an opportunity is this a low stakes enough and I don't mean to any composer or any producer who's hired no. me to put together an event that I think it's a low stakes <laughs> event but do I have an opportunity to bring someone in or can I bring someone in to shadow me can I just bring someone in to watch right. so they're in the room and they can see how it goes no that makes total sense because in the quote unquote low stakes opportunities, there's an opportunity to learn and grow. And you can't really spend time in a recording session helping someone learn and grow. They gotta be able to just hit it. Right. Helen, I was wondering about you, like pre-Maestro, you talked about it a little bit, but like what, how did you find opportunities? What, what was your experience like before these organizations grew yeah. and then since that? Yeah, I mean, I was you know fortunate enough to have a project that was ongoing when I found out about Maestra and the rise. Um, but I did, as I was working on the show K-pop, I did learn so much um, the importance of having something like Rise and Maestra, um, especially like now, you know, theater is diversifying very rapidly, and there are a lot of cultural, culture-specific shows, and you know, if we're just really not wanting to do stereotypical or you know tokenizing um, sort of work, we if we're really going for like nuanced representation, we do need a lot more diversity backstage, right? Like off off stage, and um, with K-pop, I we ran a ran into those all the time. Like, you know, it's not just the, the cast that we need to just hire Koreans or Asians. We need, um, you know, leadership, people in leadership positions and um, casting, 
you know, and uh, designers, you know, all of those, you know, um, I think it's just best uh, to sort of start with, you know, collaborating, you know, act at least have some people who ha have the knowledge. And I think it's just, it can only enrich us and the work and, and Broadway as a whole. Um, yeah, I think the, um, I, 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 it same goes with, with music, right? If I'm, if I'm just writing jazz and it's just jazz and there's no other element incorporated into it, then it's just some, this is, it, there's no originality, right? It's always like better work when we have a little bit of fusion in our life, like a little, you know, um, people with different backgrounds coming and making work together just creates something fresh. And I think that's just what progress is. And um, yeah, I think that's, um, that's what, you know, the introduction of Maestra and Rise in this community is doing. It's, it's creating progress in a way that's artistically also very fulfilling. Yeah, it's true because there are so many different aspects that get productions and compositions made. And you've all spoken about the, not behind, well, behind the scenes, the, what are they called? Is that called below the line? I never know how that, and I don't like the way that sounds, so just let's strike that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, please talk, any of you, about how important it is not only to have people in front that are diverse, but to have them on every level, how that helps. I think it helps. What's your experience been? Oh, it absolutely helps. I, rem I did a show in 2014 with Andre De Shields. I don't know if any of you know who he is, but he's yes. Yes. incredible. Shout and um, and he walked up to me the first day of rehearsal and he's like, you're one of our stage managers? And I was like, yeah. He's like, I have not worked with a black stage manager in over 30 years. And, he, and, and just hearing that from someone of that stature was so meaningful for me as much as I guess it was for him. So I think, you know, having people in the room who share your experiences and can um, be a safe space for you is so important, I think, on all levels. And I think the more that we are aware of that, the, the better, you know, this, this thing that we're building is. Um, I also think it's important uh, from the producing side. I am seeing a larger shift um, to standardized practices. So I'm thinking about budgets and how once you have someone who actually brings ac accessibility to the table of like, hey, this should be a budget line, um, you are actually creating better systems. So Can some, you explain? I just yes. want to make sure everybody understands what that means. A budget line yeah. for diversity? Is that yeah. what you're saying? Well, uh, How would you I think describe there's a lot. It? I would say, like, for I'm specifically speaking about accessibility. So, like, having captioning at shows, um, having ASL interpreters in the space. Um, it's being more mindful of inclusive practices that have never been considered before. And the thing is, with budgets, you create them. So, if you standardize a line, it's going to become a standard practice for the industry. We're seeing that happen more and more, but. If you have a diverse backstage, especially diversity in producing, um, you're going to have better leadership, I think. Um, but that's also just me and my opinion. There's a shout out. The Dramatist Guild has an inclusion writer that they're making available. If you want to add that to your contract, you can download it from the Dramatist Guild website. And it's just language that is approved to put in, to, well, approved by them to put into a contract to say, these are, these are the, my expectations for the work that we will all be doing in the space of inclusion. Yeah. Wow. Um, similar to that, I worked on the tour of Where We Belong by Madeline Syed, and part of the uh, contract is that we had an accountability rider. So if you were going to produce the show, you had to support Native artists in your area, you had to give free tickets to Native artists, and it was about cultivating community, and then if you have ever done any, um, you had to take accountability for any past uh, failings, um, which was a really radical thing. but. It was awesome just to have that. Of like, I think we forget that this people are scared of being wrong, but there's so much vulnerability in just making mistakes because we're human. We're always going to make mistakes as long as you're not causing outright harm. Um, I think there is room to be like, hey, I might have messed up once. Let me let me account for that and make up for the past mistakes I've done. Um, there's there's power in that. I agree, but it it leads me to a question that has been on my mind for a long time. And then as I've learned what Maestro and what Rise and what all of you are doing, I keep wondering, like, how are you guys responding to this anti-DEI pushback that is existing now where what you just said, which is so beautiful, think about the vulnerability of saying, hey, I might have been wrong. Oh, there are plenty of people that don't want to acknowledge 
being wrong or don't want to even acknowledge history, that's a whole other subject. But like, how how is how is Maestra dealing with that, or has that come up? Are there any legal challenges? <laughs> <laughs> oh, big no. laugh! I didn't unintentionally. No, it's laugh. all fine. It's all fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What's up? Um, I mean, how are we dealing with it? I mean, institutionally, we deal with it in with our yes and mindset on coming from a place of abundance and trying to, you know, I was on a call uh, yesterday with Masi Asari, composer Masi Asari, who wrote uh, Paradise Square. And she said, you know, when you tell me there aren't enough chairs in a room, I say, we need more chairs. Like, it's not, it's not, it's specifically to, we'll say to the white men who are saying, you're come, you're taking our jobs. Like, we're not working because you're taking our jobs. <coughs> Mossy's response was like, what if there just are more jobs? What if there's, what if we come at it from an abundance mindset? And the conversation evolved into saying, sometimes there aren't more jobs. Like when we're talking about orchestra chairs, there literally are a limited number of chairs. And so we're hiring this many trumpet players. They've always been white men. In order for us to hire a woman or a gender nonconforming person or a person of color, we are going to unhire a white man and hire this person instead. Then it starts to feel like casting, you know, as opposed to who's the best player. There are just a lot of very deep conversations that we're facing. And I will say that um, in the last year, we've hired a lawyer for the first time because we have had some um, a attacks. We've had some attacks. Can you talk about any of them? You can't really, huh? I mean, or just to say, they're in, this, they're in this category um, of, uh, of what you're doing is discriminatory in its own way. It's a, right? right, right, right. That it's discriminatory against white men. That you know, by by putting the emphasis in this direction, you're taking it away from this direction. And we are we are very clear. You know, one. I, I hope I'm not saying too much. One of the things that we have working for us is we are not actually an employing. We're not employing anybody. We are making a directory, and we are making visible candidates that you can hire. Right. So we're right. not in breach of employment law, which is actually the the crux of the oh. biggest issue that we have. So I, you know, I've said enough, except to say that I feel like what that's, that's um, what we're doing is making visible people that you can hire. Um, however, it does bring into question this bigger issue of like, are we, are we creating factions in the world? Like by, by creating, by saying these people are available and they should be hired. These people are like, but what about me? But what about me? And we try to say yes and. Yes, and When you say, I, I come from an improv background, so I know what, <laughs> so for people who don't know what yes and Oh, means, yes and, right, it's, it's, I cool guess it's a concept. very theater term, yeah. right? If you work in improv theater, the idea is everybody's making up everything if they go, if, if Vic and I are in an improv scene and I'm like, oh my gosh, you're suddenly green. She can't say, no, I'm not green. The <laughs> scene stops, she has to say yes. And here's why that happened. Right. So the improv so evolves adding to always saying yes and what comes next. Have any of you, okay, go ahead, Vic. Um, I also wanna say, American history, I'm only gonna speak to America, it repeats itself. We always have moments of progress followed by a series of backlash. And I think what we've learned every time is it's about the intentionality and the perseverance that we put into those moments, those backlash. It's, it's standing up for your community, it's having courage to speak up against those who can't. Um, so I will say it's disheartening to see this because I wish, I know I'm gonna butcher this right now, but there's like a beautiful diagram I wish I could carry everywhere that everyone could see about what equity actually looks like. And it's like two people or three people of different heights. It's not putting platforms, they're platforms all in the same place so that they're all can see at the same level. Equity is that, it's just created an equal playing field. Um, and I think the buzzwords, I think cancel culture, I think everything has spiraled in a way that makes it seem scary when reality is we've never been built in, on an equitable plane. Uh, this country was founded on genocide. Um, so I think we have to be accountable for where we came from, understand that we're always gonna have these messy moments, but um, if you lean into courage and perseverance, we can actually make it through. Um, so all that to say, I don't know where we're going, but we're gonna keep going. Um, and the RISE directory serves everyone, but we've designed it in mind so that visibility is at the forefront and that matters. I mean, it's, it's the honest truth is how things were structured before excluded a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It excluded people of color, it excluded women, it excluded, you know, all, every everything that's not, I guess, a straight white man. Sorry, I, I'm just gonna say it. 
Hi. <laughs> I just happened to look that way, and I didn't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to. Okay, anyway, I'll, I'm going to let them keep talking. But, um, Helen, you were leaning forward a little bit. Yeah. I felt like you're... No, I, I agree with you. I think the formula is, you know... It, it has embedded in it, like, you know, really privilege, privilege of, for the people who have been, you know, doing um, sort of continuing the history. And, um, but to challenge the formula to be tweaked, is, it's not easy. And, you know, I think the perseverance thing is really true. I see that post-2020, I, I saw that a lot of people were like, yes, diversity, like, you know, we need to just uproot everything, We're gonna, we have to do this all over again, and everybody was committed, sort of um, thinking that it's gonna be an easy fix. And then, you know, people, you know, so there were a lot of like productions that were, that were kind of daring and, um, you know, had a lot of like people of color and um, diversity in it. And it, when, when those shows didn't do well, you know, I think they, was, they were quickly discouraged and like people were like, eh, yeah, never mind. And, but, you know, Change takes time, and it takes it, uh, it, it takes a lot of effort, and, and it takes many tries. And I, what I'm the most concerned right now is about um, just it, it's feeling like people just want to give up. You know, like there's, but what's really important, I think, is keeping it up and keeping trying, um, and then progress will continue to be made. But once you know it's given up on. It, there's really, you know, it will be a really hard fall back to where it was. Yeah. yeah. I'd say can, I, can I link that to, I, this is, I want to say that um, if you feel disempowered by what's happening in the moment, I always say with regards to support, to find the organization who's doing the work that you want to see done in the world and support them. This is a fundraising moment for Maestra and for Rise. If you are seeing this and you're inspired, we're a not-for-profit organization and we desperately need donations. So I will just throw that out there for anyone who feels compelled. But also, if it's not us, it's somebody. Like, who is doing the work that you see in the world and the, the work that you want to see done in the world? And who, who do you, what organization do you believe in that is, in moving the needle closer to the world that you want to live in, and you can give them your time, you can give them your money, you can give them your volunteerism, you can give them, you can amplify them on social media, all of the things that you can do. If it's us, great. If it's someone else, that is fine too. Yes. Um, I also wanted to say, burnout is real, and I think sometimes we are like, we just gotta power through. No, you can take time, and I think what does that look like? It means giving yourself grace to move through so much trauma and sadness. Um, for me, I don't know, it's been a crazy year. It's been a crazy few years. Um, so what do I need for myself? It's leaning into my friendships. It's leaning into community. I feel really reinvigorated when I'm talking to people who are doing amazing work. I'm like, oh, okay, we're okay. The kids are all right, you know? Um, so I think sometimes we are like, we just gotta keep going, but also I wanna say, no, take a moment for yourself because burnout is real, and if you don't take care of yourself, it's never gonna work. You can't persevere if you're not taking a break. That's such an important point because in, in a lot of ways, I think with social media and the immediacy of what seems like things happening and movement, if things don't continue that way, it's easy to get discouraged and you have to feed yourself. That's really true, because this, this is hard work. I mean, and again, I'm going back to you, Cody, because you were saying, you know, I wish I had done more, but the bit that you've done, what you've done with these scholarships and, and whatnot, I mean, you, you, you described a little bit how good that felt for you and how you're planting seeds for those kids, aren't you? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, our job as artists is to open the door for someone else, right? And I think that the more that we can do that, the more that these directories um, take shape in our industry, we're just opening the doors for other people to step through and, and, and see that it's possible. This might seem like a strange question, but I'm, I'm curious. Well, I'll, I'll tell you my, my bit of it. I hear the expression a lot, if you see it, you can be it. And to a certain extent, I agree, but to a certain extent, I don't. Or I guess maybe my vision of seeing it didn't always mean seeing somebody that was black, 6'1", blah, blah, blah. So I'm just wondering for all of you, how, what, what's your take on that? I understand the importance, and I guess I'm also curious about the expanse of it so that we don't 
become so, if I don't see this, then I can't be it. Well, the thing is, I didn't see it. I created it for myself. Okay. So, like, yes, you could, if you see it, you have something to work towards. But when I moved here, no one told me that I couldn't do the thing that I wanted to do. Okay. So I did it. So I think that there's a version of that where you create it for yourself, and you see the thing, and that's what you work towards. And there's another version for uh, someone seeing you do the thing, and they're like, oh, I can do that. So I do think visibility and representation is so important, and that's why I try to be as visible as I can as a stage manager. And may so I people add, your outfit is very visible. <laughs> <laughs> you are working it. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, so I think that it's, it's both sides of the coin. If you see it, you can work towards something, but you can also create it for yourself. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I also agree. I mean, I, when, I, when I first came to New York, I, I didn't really see that many women composers in my in my class and also it was kind of like a guys club. Like they didn't, they also didn't see me and think that, oh yeah, she's like, Gonna be a you know a composer did you feel in the theater that from scene. Them, kind yeah, of like I did. Right. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's guy. It's like you know guys are you know like dudes you know just like bros and <laughs> and um, and you know yeah I was definitely I. It's not just about you know you seeing someone like you like yeah of course I didn't see anybody like me um, in the th Broadway theater scene uh, composer scene but uh, or rarely but um, but. Other people haven't seen them either, so they, you know, other people don't see me and say, "Oh yeah, she might be someone, you know, you know, worth checking her out her music." You know, so I think that it's once, but once I had, um, once I did have work out on uh, through K-pop, I did see a lot of young um, young kids come up to me and say, "You know, I didn't think that I can do this, but I." It, like she, seeing the show and seeing your work encouraged me to try to to work towards becoming a, a composer and a writer. Um, and I think, you know, just those people and also other people seeing that, oh, there is an Asian woman in there. Oh, yeah. So those, yeah, everyone is, it has the possibility. You know, it just kind of broadens everyone's perspective on that. That's a great point. Yeah. They, everyone can see it. Georgia? I, your question's making me think about this differently than I ever have, because of course that is, Janine Tesori said it at the Tony Awards, for girls you have to see it to be it. Um, and that is like one of our, you know, light, lighthouse quotes. And yet, um, to me I think that it is possibility. You have to see the possibility, right? That I love, yeah. As opposed to necessarily the, the person who looks like me or that sort of thing. And um, there is, and I, th I think that is also something about power. I tell this story a lot. We have a, a woman on our advisory board who's given me permission to tell her story. She's a professional flutist, and um, she's working the highest level, Broadway flutist. And she says when she was at the age in middle school or elementary school when you choose an instrument, she said, I want to play the flute. And her band director, s wait, I'm sorry, I messed up the story already. She said, I want to play the drums. Mm -hmm. And the band director said, oh, no, 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 boys play the drums. You could should play like the flute or the clarinet or something. She was like, okay, I'll play the flute. And so she did, and she's a professional flutist, and she's gone on to great success. But she says, I now, I've spent a lot of time wondering if I would have been a good drummer and why he got to decide. You know, and it's so powerful to me that story because there you you have so much power when you're dealing with especially young people, but anyone who's emerging as an artist or stepping into their own identity, that you have the power to say yes and or to encourage them and say this is possible for you. And you know, I also wanted to add that all of my mentors have been men. All of my mentors have been white men, and they have opened door after door after door for me. I mean, I really, I want to make sure to say that I, I have had the successes that I had because white men who were in power invited me in to be their assistants. Um, and yet, I was not commissioned until a woman commissioned me. As a, I had the, my first two jobs as a writer were because a woman in power said, "I think you can handle writing this score." And those, the first, this. Though, you know, the men did not find their way to hiring me in that job. So there's, there's something about seeing the possibility of, is that path available to me? Are people going to make space? Are people going to allow me into the space? Do I have to fight to be in the space? Do I have to be the one who's always saying like, you know, the, always the trailblazer? Or can I just step into the space because I deserve to be here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I also, there's like this undercurrent when you just said the possibility, I was thinking of what Helen said earlier of like, oh, I did K-pop writing because I was like, oh, I can be a songwriter that way. And I never thought I could do it 
And then just thinking about your Broadway debut being K-pop the musical, you created two things you loved and were able to see it come together, that self-actualization, right? Um, and then Cody just saying, you did it. You saw the possibility and you did it. And I think so much of our paths are, you're never going to know where you end up, right? So much, it's so winding. Um, but I think about the possibilities there. And most of the time in this industry, you kind of have to forge your own path. And I think sometimes people forget that. It, it doesn't look one way. And I think to see it, to be, what is the statement? I'm going to mess it up. A yeah. variation of if you see it, you can be it. Yeah, but I think um, with this industry specifically, there are so many possibilities, and so much of it is you get to decide what you are. I, I created the Rise directory of an amazing group of people, and I never thought that would be where I was, but if I think about all my past experiences, it makes sense I'm here, you know? Um, and I think that's really awesome. No, I love that, and you've helped me clarify it, because I did, I've had conversations with people, and they, you know, they insist on that, and I've I thought about myself and what inspired me. Carol Burnett in Once Upon a Mattress inspired me, you know? She doesn't look, we don't look the same, you know? A lot of different things, a lot of different disciples and I, uh, disciplines, I mean, and I think, well, they were, she's kind of a disciple, but anyway. Um, but the idea of the, of the expansiveness and, and uh, you know, Cody, what you said about, you know, you, no one told you you couldn't, which is just as important. Um, this is kind of a related question. Does, for all of you, does being a first in what you've done, creating this, does that get tiresome? Is that a, a burden, do you feel like, sometimes? Where sometimes even being a first sounds like it's being used as a way of diminishing what you've done. I remember, this isn't theater related, but I remember Ketanji Brown Jackson when she was up for the Supreme Court and there was talk about her being the first black woman in consideration, there was a lot of pushback from white men saying, well, you know, why, why, why can't she just be the best? Which I thought meant, oh, so best excellence is like a, and please don't be upset. Um, <laughs> it's just a white man's dominion, you know? I mean, that can't, anyway. Your thoughts on this? I hope I made sense. Helen, yeah. I made sense to you, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. I, I I feel like really honored when people, you know, say the first Asian Broadway um, composer, things like that. And yeah, I feel honored in the responsibility and um, also feeling like, oh, I maybe like paved the road for, you know, more Asian um, people like me. But at the same time, I have never thought of myself as an Asian until I came to America. Like, the, you know, I was just Korean and, um, you know, I thought China and Japan, all the all these other countries in Asia are just like foreign countries. I have nothing to do. You know, there's there's nothing to really like. You know, it, I never really felt like we we're like the same people. But in America, we we're kind of all clumped together, and you're uh, you 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 know you're Asian, and we can't have two Asians in this. Like you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, you know, you're Asian, you're 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 black. Like you know, it's kind of like. And I'm, um, so yeah, in that sense, sometimes I feel like it blocks f people from just seeing my work and my, you know, my voice as this. And, you know, I have a unique experience. I, obviously, I told you about like me being in pre med and then like doing, going all the convoluted ways. And, you know, um, and yeah, I just have my own unique experience, experience and I think that in an ideal world, like in my uh, fantasy, like um, diversity, I think uh, w when when there's true diver diversity and true just, um, you know, equity is when people are just seen, like their voices are seen. And yeah, I agree with you. Like I, I relate to Ariel in Little Mermaid, like the most, you know, she's not Asian, but like I totally, you know, saw myself in that character. And I just think that we can, I, I hope the same for, you know, a, a white girl to look at an a Asian lead character and say, oh, that's me, you know, and so, yeah, that kind of, um, yeah, th that's what I envision as, like, the best sort of form of diversity. I see, I hear you. Vic, you were going to say something, and then, um, oh. I, 
Oh, no, I thought you were going to. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. I feel like what you're saying, uh, being the first, goes along with your, what you were saying before about if you see it, you can believe it. You know, so I celebrate anytime someone is the first to do anything because we have to a recognize it, we have to celebrate it, and then know that someone else is going to be able to do that after they've done it. Like uh, Didi Aiti, who just won uh, a Tony for costume designing a play, was the first Black woman to do that. You know what I mean? So like, I think that we have to name these things, we have to celebrate them. Talking about Little Mermaid, Halle Bailey, who played Little Mermaid, was a Black uh, mermaid. Right. All these kids seeing her do that, we have to name the things that are f that are the first, so then other people know what it is, and then also can strive to do something like that. I guess on a personal level, I was just wondering for all of you if that ever felt burdensome. That it's part. exciting to me. I love it. You know, I mean, I mean, and not to say that I'm the first in a lot of places, but it's, it's it, you get to forge your own path, you get to walk on it, and 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 the pressure that people are putting on the first is coming from them, not on you. You know, so for me, I get to do things that I'm passionate about and things that I love. So if I'm the first person to do that, amazing. And then hopefully, you know, so to me, it's exciting, and and I, and that's the way that I look at it. I want you to be my shrink. We'll talk afterwards. <laughs> I need help. Yes. No. But I was going to say the same thing as Cody. I was like, oh, I'm very ambitious. I love being the first. Not that I've done many firsts, but I do think about, like, I grew up with immigrant culture, and I had a lot of uh, expectations of, like, I was the first one to graduate college in my family, and that was a huge achievement, right? So for me, it's honoring everyone who came before me, I and mean, I think that's really what's so beautiful. I just want to add to that, that we just did a workshop with Lisa Crone. She did a, an event for Maestro. She, um, she and Janine Tesori got the award for being the first all-female team to win the best uh, book and score. No, not book, but best music and lyrics for Tony Award. And she said she was uncomfortable with the first title because, yes, I'm the first to get this award, but I'm not the first to do this job. And she said people have always been here doing this job. Women have always done this job. And she said she told a story about going to visit an opera house and looking at the names of the history. And she was like, there are women on here that I've never heard of, but they were here doing the work and in their time when they were acknowledged. So I can't carry the mantle of first. Maybe I was the first person to get the award in this industry that you all decided was important, but I'm not the first to do it. Oh, that's a great way of looking at it, because that, again, it's, it's really expansive. I'm just wondering, um, Georgia, of the different uh, resources that Maestra has, if there are any in particular that, that need more exposure. You've got your directory, you've got a jobs board, membership, stu student maestros. What are the student maestros? <laughs> yes, OK. So we, um, I mean, the center of the organization is the directory, where uh, anyone who joins the directory is, is a member of, becomes a member of Maestra and is, is, has access to all of these programs. I'm actually going to look at your list. Um, the <laughs> there is a jobs board on the directory. Student maestros is we have regional and affinity groups. And so Maestra has expanded around the world. And like in New England, in Boston-centric, there's a regional group. And there's a Pacific Northwest group. And there's, um, and we have have uh, program heads who, who run and organize the regional groups and the affinity groups where we link people by their affinity. So students are, uh, the student maestros are affinity group and we also have maestro pride and we also have maestro composer lyricists and we have maestro moms and we have maestro music directors. Um, and so to people who, who are working in this space might say, you know, what do we have in common other than that we all play instruments or what is it like to be a mom navigating the space and also trying to do eight shows a week? And where are the people I can talk to about that? Um, there are many more, and I'll encourage you to visit the website. I think we have to wrap up soon, so um, oh. I'll encourage you to visit oh, the oh, website. Oh, oh, hi. Oh, I see that. <laughs> I, oh, my goodness. That was a five, not a wave. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, no, I'm having such a good time. I like want to pull everything out of you guys because it's, it's such an, it's, it's been such an interesting uh, journey for me. And to know that this organization exists now, which it didn't when I was starting out, is so, is so amazing. And I'm, I'm just jazzed by hearing the work that you guys have done and how exciting you are and how excited you are. And I, I guess I want to know by a show of hands, who here belongs to Maestra and who does not? Let's see. Who does not? Or a rise profile. Okay, you do. Let's do the who does. Who does? I'm who sorry. Who is in the Maestra or Rise? Who the Maestra? Great. Okay. And Rise, who's... All right. You guys who are... are your hands aren't up, join. <laughs> Become a part of it. These people are amazing. And um, I, 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 would, I guess if there's anything else that you'd like to say in closing that you'd like to share with the people in the room, go for it. I have one. I have one. 
Thank you, Georgia. I have lots of little nuggets that I throw out every time right. we get to talk. One of them is um, I have adopted this um, plus one mentality that anytime you are invited to an event and you are asked to bring a plus one, bring someone who would benefit from being in the room with you. Not just your spouse or your partner or your person or your best friend, but bring like the person who did not get the invitation who should be in the room, who would benefit from that. Um, and it, it, it's a way to grant access and to, to get people into the room. That's a great one. Any other nuggets up here? <laughs> and just in general, uh, having, uh, having done, created Maestro five years ago and Rise, it's now been a year. One, one year. year. How have the stats changed in a general way? Are, are more women, are more people of color, are more uh, you know, people with disabilities, more uh, gender fluid? I, what's the story? How's it going? We are collecting stats because stats do speak. Um, but I will say in one year, we have 3, 000, over 3,200 users in the Rise Theater directory. And that's just by word of mouth. And cold emailing people, asking them to create profiles. So it says a lot. There's change happening, and I'm just really grateful to be part of that change. That's wonderful, and, and let's spread the word. You can keep the word going, and everybody that's watching, get on to Meister and Rise's uh, various um, uh, what are they called? Directories. Directories. I'll say also that this year we've been keeping data from all the Broadway shows and who's in the pits and who's on the music teams. And this year there was not a single show that didn't have at least one maestro working on the team. Oh, in the how pit. wonderful! <laughs> Georgia Stitt, composer, lyricist, and founder of Maestro, Victoria Detrez, program manager for Rise, Helen Park, first Asian female composer on Broadway, Cody Renard Richard. Broadway stage manager and founder of CRR Scholarship Program. Thank you all so much for and sharing And Nancy Giles. You're Thank amazing. you so much.